Prepare for a rude awakening. Four thousand years ago, the creator of the universe made an everlasting covenant with Abraham. All the land, from the Euphrates to the Nile, belongs to the sons of Israel. Shock waves will shake the earth as heaven reaches down to fulfill that promise. The Dead Sea the lowest point on planet Earth once described as a well-watered plain like the Garden of the Lord. Nearly 4,000 years ago, the crust of the Earth split open and out of its bowels belched fire and brimstone that rained down upon the cities of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim. Abraham stood in the door of his tent on the other side of these mountains and watched as the cities and their inhabitants were incinerated in the inferno. The Jordan River continues to wash minerals from the highlands of Israel into this dead-end chasm. And what appeared to be distant, nondescript rock formations out in the middle of the sun-parched Israeli desert turns out to be the ashen remains of the cities of the plain, found still standing and covered with millions of chunks of brimstone. I'm Michael Rood. Prepare for a rude awakening. In the book of Genesis, we read that God instructed Abraham to leave the land of Babylon and its perverted system of sun god worship. The Almighty had already confused the languages and scattered the inhabitants of Babylon to slow down the development of Nimrod's political, economic, and religious world government system. The worship of Nimrod's son, Tammuz, the reincarnated sun god, and the worship of Nimrod's wife, reincarnated as Ishtar, were both fragmented into divergent cults at the Tower of Babel. For thousands of years, religiously motivated military campaigns kept these once unified peoples from joining forces to rebuild the one world government that Nimrod had begun. Raised in the land of Shinar, Abraham was instructed to leave Babylon behind, crossing over the Euphrates River into a land that God would give his descendants. Abraham became the first Hebrew, Hebrew meaning to cross over, when he crossed over the Euphrates, leaving Babylonian paganism far behind. The Hebrew scriptures from Genesis to Revelation clearly define God's intention to purge pagan sun god worship from the land promised Abraham and then from the entire earth. The Creator has determined the purpose of life, and He states emphatically how He does and does not wish to be worshipped. Abraham was 75 years old when he left Babylon bringing his nephew Lot and their families with him. Upon entering the land, Lot joined himself to a prosperous culture that had developed on this then fertile plain. Lot took up residence in the city of Sodom. The prophet Ezekiel said that the sin of Sodom was pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. She did not strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They were haughty and committed abominations. Sorry for this rude interruption, but if you want to know how to get on the bad side of the Almighty, search the scriptures for what God calls an abomination. The word abomination is translated from the harshest words in the Hebrew language, tova and sheketz, and they mean perverted, disgusting, repulsive, sick, putrid, vile, you get the picture. Their self-indulgent lifestyle led to a perversion named after the city, sodomy, 
commonly known today as homosexuality. Abraham was forewarned that the sin of Sodom might have reached the point that divine intervention was required. Two angels who appeared as men left Abraham's tent to see what was transpiring in the city of Sodom. Upon arrival, the angels were welcomed into the home of Lot, but an aroused group of homosexual men demanded that Lot send these strangers out to them so that they could rape them. Lot refused, so they attacked him on his front porch. The angels pulled Lot to safety inside the house and smote the entire mob with blindness. The scriptures record that they wore themselves out as they groped the house looking for the door. At sunrise, the angels took Lot, his wife, and two daughters by the hands, dragging them away from the city. Soon, fire and brimstone rained down from heaven, turning the city into a raging inferno. That is when some scientists believed that the 3,000-mile Great Rift Valley was formed, when the earth's crust fractured and belched fire and brimstone into the heavens. As the brimstone showered down upon the cities, Abraham saw the smoke of Sodom rise up in the distance. But until the smoke cleared, Abraham had no idea that Lot was saved from destruction. The buildings, streets, and walkways throughout the land of Israel are constructed primarily of what is commonly referred to as Jerusalem stone. Like the walls of the ancient city of Jerusalem behind me, a calcium rock which is as abundant in Israel as stray cats in the old city, and if you've ever been here, you know what I mean. The inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah would no doubt have taken advantage of this most common building material for their homes, palaces, and fortress walls just as is used throughout the land today. Archaeologists contribute Sodom and Gomorrah's overt wealth to the flourishing vegetation and the commercial value of the asphalt pits found in this once lush valley. Asphalt, oozing from deep in the earth, turns this wadi into a surreal landscape. The builders of the cities on this plain had access to an unlimited supply of asphalt with which to cement their buildings into indestructible fortresses. Indestructible until burning brimstone rained from the sky, igniting the asphalt mortar and turning the city into a furnace. Calcium plus sulfur plus fire yields gypsum ash, and that is exactly what remains of these cities. These structures appear as rock formations from a distance, but those who venture out into this deserted, lion-prowled wasteland soon find their trek to become laborious as they sink ankle deep in this gypsum ash. When this ash is subjected to flame, it does not even change color. It has already been completely consumed. Substances burned with sulfur can have a higher remaining ash weight than the original substance. That may explain, in part, how this sphinx-shaped object and others like them can remain standing throughout the centuries. The layers of ash, twisted and warped by the intense heat, finally settle into a form that much resembles the original object. The mineral rainfall on this desert contributes to the longevity of these structures, slowly compacting the layers of ash through the centuries. A 90 degree angle rarely occurs in nature, a phenomenon that we diligently search for when looking for a man-made artifact. And on this plateau, we observe two identical elongated pyramids, which highlight the grand entry into the temple site here at Gomorrah. They are identical in length, width, height, and angle of incline, an impossible combination for a naturally occurring rock formation. The entire area surrounding Gomorrah is rock. These are the mountains of Judea, and we are standing on the remains of Herod's mountain fortress of Masada. At its base are the stone cordon encampments of the Roman army that besieged the Jewish zealots who were barricaded on this mountain after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 of the Common Era. 
The Romans encamped on the gravel bed of this surrounding plain. But the city of Gomorrah, beyond these encampments, is unique in its structure and composition. Walls, buildings, and temple structures reminiscent of the ancient temples of Babylon are preserved as heavy gypsum ash. Moses referred to the condition of this area by saying, The Lord overthrew Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim in his anger and wrath. The whole land is brimstone and salt and ashes. It is not sown, nor bears fruit, nor grows any grass. Desert gazelles scrap a meager menu from the stubble that grows from the bottom of the wadis. Dry riverbeds that are occasionally flooded by rainwater cascading from the Judean mountains. The gazelles scour the wadis in search of vegetation, but occasionally paw the ash on the plateaus to find a nutritious treat. This is a natural mineral salt lick, the salt of which Moses spoke. Mineral salts from the bodies of the incinerated citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah continue to leach to the surface even after 4,000 years. After the atomic bombs were dropped that ended World War II in the Pacific, U.S. military inspectors at Hiroshima found piles of white powder near the blast site. Analysis proved the powder to be the mineral salts of the incinerated individuals who were vaporized in the fireball. All that was left was a pile of salt. That discovery and the salt licks of Sodom and Gomorrah may answer the question, what became of Lot's wife? The scriptures indicate she turned back to the doomed city and became not a literal pillar, but in the Hebrew, a memorial of salt. All that's left of her and the entire population is the mineral salts which the desert gazelle now eat. 